A lot of us know that Kenner Star Wars had a last 17 series, but what happened with G.I. Joe? We don't really hear people talking about G.I. Joe's last 17. So let's take a look. G'day everyone, welcome back to Frostbite's G.I. Joe Repro. So today we're gonna to chat about G.I. Joe's last 17. If you're, uh, if you're literally just hearing the term last 17 right now, that means you're not really a uh, kind of Star Wars collector, um, you know, from back in the day. It's uh, last 17's uh, a term given to Star Wars toys that were released by Kenner back in the day. Um, so, you know, I sort of wanted to take a look at um, the comparison between G.I. Joe's last 17 and Kenner Star Wars last 17. And I only do this because I I, uh, I have a, you know, I have a Star Wars Kenner vintage collection. Um, I really quite like it. And, you know, it holds a bit of a place in my heart. I had some of the figures as a kid and it's, uh, it's really nice just to have them on display with my G.I. Joe's. Um, so yeah, let's sort of go into the last 17 thing a little bit. Um, so basically when the, the movies were released, you know, we, we remember episode four, five, and six, um, of the Star Wars, or being the Star Wars trilogy, um, the original releases. And so the final release being Return of the Jedi in 1983. Um, when this occurred, Kenner, being the toy producer um, for these items, you know, they started winding down the toy production of the Star Wars toys. And between 1984 and 1985, they released one final set and it's been labelled the last 17. So it was Power of the Force. Um, that's what it was actually called. Uh, it was 17 figures. It was actually, as far as I know, it was 15 figures and then two other figures. Um, but, yeah, it's been termed by the general public as the last 17. Um, and that line contained characters from Return of the Jedi, droids, and Ewoks. Um, so if you do collect vintage Kenner Star Wars... You'll know that these are the the figures that you know they're going to be the they're going to give you the the biggest heartache in your collecting um, out of any of the line. Um, so, with those seventeen figures in Australia, at least they'll range from eighty dollars um, up to anywhere up to geez six hundred Australian dollars. Um, so, you know, if you, if you're trying to get that full collection, it can be a bit of a problem. Um, so that was in, that was between 84 and 85 and with the Star Wars stuff, we didn't actually see anything until mid nineties that was actual Star Wars. Um, we saw droids and Ewoks released, although I, I personally didn't see it released in my town here in Australia. Um, but it did occur. Um, so, yeah, nothing was sort of released until the 90s. And, you know, what we sort of got in the mid-90s wasn't good at all. Um, so I sort of took this and I, I went and had a look at the G.I. Joe line um, because there's not really a lot said about what was released when and what changed in the lines. So I went and took a look and it it was a bit of a clear case. So in 1994, we got a whole bunch of figures and then we didn't get anything. Um, you know, we, we got G.I. Joe Extreme. And let me tell you, it wasn't great. And the hilarity of it is um, it came down to Hasbro handing the production rights of these toys over to Kenner. 
uh, because they've just recently acquired them. Um, so, yeah, go to Yojo, uh, 3D Joe's, whatever you use, and take a look at the G.I. Joe Extreme, and you'll see what I mean. They, they weren't great at all. So for that reason, I sort of used the logic of, uh, you know, the last 17 and, and then they got poo. Um, so I used that with GI Joe and I looked at the last year that we were still getting decent figures and that was 1994. And whilst we didn't have, quite have 17, we had 15 uh, in that 1994 that were V1 figs. I didn't want to, you know, do the classic thing of looking at every single re-release that G.I. Joe has done uh, in 1994. So I took out all of the, uh, you know, extra variants and just looked at V1s in 1994, um, to which there were 15 of. So we almost made it to 17. We got to 15. Uh, so, yeah. Let's take a look. First up, we've got uh, Ice Cream Soldier. You know, like I, uh, I've sort of seen the, this one hanging around for a while now. I tend to stay away from Battle Core. But I don't think it's a great line. I think the figures look okay. Um, but just generally the big chunky weapons... Uh, and just the million accessories, it just seems like a bit of a painful, um, you know, line to collect. They go for reasonably cheap here in, in Australia. I don't know what it's like in America, but, uh, yeah, here in Australia, you can be picking them up for, you know, just for the more common ones, probably 50 to 70 Australian dollars. Um, which makes it quite the difference from the uh, anywhere from 150 to 400 um, Australian dollars for generally your V1s. Um, but yeah, Ice Cream Soldier. It's got this uh, hilarious mix of colours on him. Um, uh, weapons, like check out all the reuses. Uh, yeah, it's, you know... It's it's a fun figure, but I think the story is the the fun part of him. Um, so if you check out his file card, and you know, I'll let you do that in your own time. Uh, but effectively, it listen uh, lists you know all of his normal stuff: file name, grade, birthplace. It has his primary specialty as a fire operations expert, uh, and his secondary specialty as a barbecue chef. It just cracked me up. Uh, it comes along straight away with the uh, with the statement of eating ice cream without hot fudge is like fighting without ammunition. Um, and his file card reads that the last thing you would expect from G.I. Joe's fiercest flamethrower commando is for him to be called Ice Cream Soldier. However, it's a perfect cover for him because when Cobra hears the Joes are sending a guy into battle with a code name like that. They don't expect much more than a sweet toothed kid with chocolate ice cream stains splattered on his fatigues. Cobra's perceptions of him change fast when they see him fire up his supercharged flamethrower and blast 75 foot streams of flaming gasoline into their foxholes and munition stumps. Talk about a firefight. The ice cream soldier is a one-man inferno who scorches those slimy stakes until they melt like hot fudge on a summer sidewalk. Um, you know, just the... It, I mean, we all know that Larry Harmer wrote a lot of the file cards um, and, you know, getting to the end of this, uh, you know, decent line, it's great to sort of have a file card like that that sort of, to me, harkens a bit back into um, the original file cards. So, yeah, that, that made me laugh a little bit. Um, apparently, Ice Cream Soldier's body was entirely original and no parts were taken from other figures. The mould was used in 2002, though, to create the Shock Viper. All right, next up. 
sort of start hitting these star brigade figures um and this one is known as carcass so uh his primary military specialty being mercenary hunter and secondary planetary alien destruction they they were to, in my opinion they were like hasbro was starting to lose their their shit at this time um so you know yeah star brigade that's cool i would have imagined that cobra was fighting gi joe in in the stars or october guard bring them back but instead we got aliens um it's a bit, a bit weird uh his file card says leaving nothing but broken bones and smashed dwellings in his wake carcass is a born menace to the universe he has stomped through alien towns destroying all that he can and making prisoners of its fearful inhabitant inhabitants he's even gone so far as to mistakenly attack a star brigade outpost narrowly escaping capture by ducking into an asteroid belt his mutated body which may account for his overly hostile attitude is considered ugly even to other lunatic aliens more hideous than he Carcass, uh, Predaton and, or Predacon and Lobotomax discovered Earth and were heading towards it, uh, aboard a Lunar Tixin, uh, starship to plunder it when Unicron arrived and consumed the ship. Unicron enslaved many to maintain his body and Carcass was later found alive and inside, unsuccessfully trying to prevent Flint and Cosmos from unleashing the metal eating spores that destroyed the Chaos Bringer. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of backstory there, uh, as far as the figure goes, you know, as you would expect th this body was completely original and no parts were taken from other figures. Um, and man, it, it was a, these aliens are weird looking builds. Well, I could sort of think when I looked at these aliens as well is, um, you know, you could be staring at these things in secondhand shops and not know what they are. Um, you know, you could look at that and I reckon it'd only be the weapons. If the weapons were sitting with the figure that you would know that it's an actual G.I. Joe figure. Um, I sort of felt looking at these things too, that they, whilst it looked to me like Hasbro was losing their shit, uh, you know, after staring at them for a bit, they look cool. Um, and I think if I was going to get them, I'd get them a uh, mint on card. I'd, you know, I wouldn't sort of be looking for them too much as loose figures. I think the uh, just having the, the big G.I. Joe banner up the side of the card looks great with them on there. Uh, next up. Got this guy, Lobotomax. Um, I won't bother talking about specialties because they're alien hunters. Uh, a friend to no one, Lobotomax hates humanoids and fellow lunatics, aliens alike. Proud of his bounty hunter reputation, he's known throughout the cosmos as one of the most unmerciful creatures ever hatched. His monstrous tail can disable enemies in one powerful whack. Seldom does prey escape a bite from his venomous fangs. Unfortunately for him, his intelligence is, is extremely limited due to the loss of brain tissue suffered when the top of his skull was sliced off during a laser sable duel with Predacon. Uh, once again, body is completely original, as you may expect. What a weird figure. I sort of looked at this one. I thought, man, look at the neck on this guy. Um, it's just, it's a weird figure. But, you know, that's what we wanted at the time is different figures. What we didn't get was different weapons. Um, and even down to the point of we're seeing Snake Eyes V3 Uzi sitting there. So... Whatevs. All right. Next up, we have Predacon. Um, 
He is apparently a vicious, a vicious lunat, <laughs> lunatrix alien. Uh, Predacon makes his living by capturing cri- criminals and selling them back to the galactic authorities. If the authorities uh, reject the criminals, Predacon imprisons them and these private aliens do. This forearm monster is loyal only to his tribal clan on planet Trillium, and he's proud to wear its ancestral medallion on his chest plate, along with Lunatrix hieroglyphics that are etched into his arm guards. Uh, once again, body's original, and how awesome do the forearms look on him? Dreadlocks there, they look cool. I, um... I think I looked at the other two figures and then saw this figure and was starting to get more and more impressed with it. Uh, but check out these weapons. Like, total just reuse of stuff. And it sort of made me think, you, Hasbro, you went to all the, the big deal of giving these beautiful original characters and then you just gave us... Uh, uh, tunnel Rat, Airborne, Shockwave, Hit and Run, Mask Rat. Um, just, you know, pretty bad reuse. I normally don't care about reuse, but, uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, by this point, 1994, you could have given us newer stuff. Cobra Blackstar, I, I reasonably like this uh, figure. Um, so apparently Cobra Blackstar is an elite space pilot uh, and also a tactical squad leader. Cobra Commander has formed an allegiance with the Blackstar forces, a secretive legion of space pilots whose origins remain unknown. This particular Cobra Black Star is the best pilot out of all of the Black Star ranks. He, like all Black Stars, behaves, behaves as if space is his natural habitat. They have incredible agility in zero gravity, gravity zones, climb planetary craters with ease, and instinctively avoid astro belts while engaged in stellar dogfights. No one has ever seen a Black Star up close, and rumors have spread throughout the galaxy that they may not even be human. Uh, so apparently with the figure, the waist and legs were originally used to create barricades. So they've, they've reused barricades, weight, uh, waist and legs. Uh, but his head, chest and arms are original. It's really not a bad looking figure, this one. Um, we sort of see... Uh, Rock Vipers, Rock Puncher weapon there. Um, and Hasbro at this point just loved the fact that these, you know, they were giving them blasters that had uh, actual shooting missiles. It was just such a big thing with Hasbro around this point And yeah, whatever. Um, the use of colors on this is fantastic. That green and gold and black and, and silver looks great. Next up, effects. Uh, this one sort of cracked me up a little bit. So effects is an explosives expert whose services combined with his mesmerizing special effects wizardry have proven invaluable to the G.I. Joe team. Effects creates masterful special effects to confuse Cobra troops. He throws them off guard with dazzling lights, sounds, and explosions, drawing their attention away from his target location. He's then able to wire an enemy base camp, munitions dump, or command stations with his own handmade explosives and blow the structure to smithereens. Um, body is original, nothing taken from anything else. Uh, I, I thought this was actually not a bad looking figure is, 
sort of smile was a bit munted there. Um, but yeah, you can tell it's original. We haven't seen this before. He came with that uh, that launcher that I, I think that was Incinerator that had that V1 Incinerator. Um, and it was always a good piece of toy, uh, you know, coming with the rubber band that you could hook up to it and it would actually fire the projectiles off. Um, all in all, this figure, I, I didn't mind this figure. I think that use of green on the, the gun, like if that was a black uh, or a silver, this would win. This would be a great figure just from the look of it. I'm still not sure about, um, you know, him using his dazzling lights and special effects in space and how that works and, and yeah, but what else? Uh, next up, we've got Gears. So Gears is a technological genius, apparently. His first big invention come when he helped bring Robo Joe to life uh, by integrating human muscle, human muscles and brainwaves with robotic battle armor and computer circuitry. This process led to the development of the power fighter units that operate as an extension of the pilot's own body, um, only with a lot more firepower and combat capabilities. This technological breakthrough and gears a place in the National Inventors Hall of Fame, as well as a place on Cobra, uh, Cobra's top 10 hit list, apparently. Um, Gears was named Joe Marone, uh, and apparently that was named after a Hasbro engineer of the same name at the time. Um, and, I mean, if you are looking at this figure and it looks familiar, it's Barricade. Flat out Barricade, just a repaint. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I... I can't even sort of, um, can't tell you that the colors look great. It's used to, they were very big on the green around this time, different, different shades of green. Uh, but yeah, barricade was a good looking figure. So yeah, this one's all good. Next up we have space shot. Space Shot was known throughout the galaxy as a flyby uh, night freight, freighter pilot with a rebellious reputation. Blindfolded, he'd fly loads of cargo through the rings of Saturn for fun, the kind of fun most pilots would have nightmares about. Duke knew he couldn't uh, pass up on recruiting such a skilled pilot, and after a few hard lessons in military discipline, Space Shot became less of a rebel and more of a hero. He has since defended four space stations from Cobra attacks, and he makes Cobra Black Star pilots look like flight school trainees. Um, this figure, I quite liked it. Um, the use of the colors, just that not, it actually looks like a cross between um, sort of an, a white Iron Grenadier's uniform and an actual space suit. Um, so his waist and legs came from Mutt V3 in 92 and his arms were from Countdown in 1988, uh, but his head and chest are original and not used on any other figures. It's a pity with that, uh, with the art on the box, you know, we see grenades on his chest, they, uh, they weren't painted through. Um, they didn't give us all the detail that they had up there, which is a bit of a pity. And I've chucked it on here as well. So you can see his helmet and his uh, gun, which, you know, that looks like the one from Ambush. Um, but this backpack, I was sort of looking at the things on there and then I noticed on the, the packaging for this guy, that he comes with a cosmic climbing backpack because, you know, uh, climbing and grenades are two things that would be heavily useful in, uh, in space, apparently. 
Yeah. All right. Next up, we have the Action Marine. So 1994 was basically filled with one guy that was uh, Battle Corps. Oh, sorry, all the V1s. Uh, one guy that was Battle Corps, a whole bunch of Space Brigade, and a whole bunch of these guys, which are the uh, the remakes of the um, 1964 versions of G.I. Joe, the OGs. Um, and same again, looking at the the aliens in the Space Brigade series and then checking these things out, I had a lot more appreciation after seeing all of these thick things. So the file card for this guy says US Marines are considered to be the toughest fighters in the world. And that's exactly what I thought until I joined GI Joe. It takes a lot of courage, strength and stamina to fight evil the way we do, which is to say that we battle to the bitter end and never stop stomping our enemies until victory is achieved. Whether I'm fighting on dry barren desert or making a commando raid on an enemy beach bunker, I know I can count on my training and my teammates to get the job done. Um, Action Marines chest and arms were also used to create uh, G.I. Joe, like the figure, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, whilst his, his head was shared with Action Soldier, which we'll go through again as well. Um, so basically, all all the parts from these figures, like I'm going to go through a bunch of these, they all had um, parts that were interchanged with each other. So um, they didn't come with anyone else. So you're not going to see, you know, Shockwave's legs or, or something like that. Um, they were all interchanged with this line of 19... 64 commemorative edition figures. Um, so I won't bother talking about reuses from now on. Uh, this guy came with a black rifle, a green backpack, a missile launcher, which was spring loaded and actually fired. Um, a black <laughs> missile, a two piece black raft, black ore, and post to connect the rifle to the raft. Um, so the most interesting part here was that massive bazooka and the fact that he was using it on a raft, um, you know, they're, they're giving you all the parts here that you can conduct your riverine ops or, you know, you're on the dry land with the bazooka. Yeah. There was a lot of cool features about this and it was really nicely presented in this box set, which I thought was great as well. Um, so the, interestingly, the mold for a lot of these figures that we'll go through as well, they were used to create those, uh, those keychain figures um, that you'll see around and yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting because I've seen the uh, keychain figures before and I sort of wondered where the parts come from for that. And it was these guys, which makes a lot of sense. Next up, we have the action pilot. Uh, he came with, you know, everything shown there. You're getting rifles, pistols, the parachute backpack, which we've definitely seen before, uh, I thought at least. Um, I'm pretty sure that backpack, you know, was used for Sky Patrol and, and the parachute pack, a whole number of things. Um, so his file card says, when I finally flew my first solo flight at the age of 15, I knew instantly that I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. I never guessed I would be fortunate enough to be recruited for the G.I. Joe team. True, I had become one of the most decorated Air Force pilots to ever hit the sky, but to join up with fellow fighters like the Joes was the greatest honour I could ever possibly receive. Every time I step into the cockpit and fire up those sweet-sounding engines, I take pride in knowing I'm an essential part of the most elite fighting force ever assembled. 
Um, these like these figures that were created obviously it was at the end of the line um, before they went lunatic with with Kenner. Uh, so you know they they're great looking figures, I reckon, and they just have that classic feel to the to them. So um, yeah, they look great. Uh, next up, you have the action pilot astronaut. Uh, you can see him pictured right there. Uh, so this, you know, we were getting individual, individually packed, uh, figures and also getting these, this box set. Um, so the individually packed sets were the V1s and the box set came with, uh, some V1s and also V2s. His file card says, when I was recruited into G.I. Joe's fighter pilot training program, I had no idea that the jet would lead me into space. Uh, after my training and the success I achieved flying high-tech jets, I became one of the first men assigned for duty in the Mercury series of US manned space flights. A 3,000-pound Mercury capsule, capsule was my home for 31 hours as I orbited the Earth more than 20 times. It was a job where I had to be a pilot, a research scientist, and a pioneering explorer all at the same time, and it was the most thrilling challenge a pilot could ever undertake. That looks like a sweet uh, box set as well, but you just want to crack it open and like those figures are dying to be played with. Look at them. Next up, Action Sailor. So the Navy Frogman. Since joining the Joes, I've held the record for personally sinking more enemy ships than the entire third fleet. And that's on a bad day. I've torpedoed so many hulls, I'm surprised the ocean hasn't overflowed with scrap iron. On dry land, I'm a fish out of water. I'd rather be on the sea sled than in a tank or a jet fighter. Luckily, I have plenty of courageous teammates to handle those jobs. Making the sea safe from criminal scum is my life's work, and I can't think of a better way to do it than as a member of G.I. Joe. So you can see he's... Uh, yeah, coming with a whole bunch of stuff. That was a really nice thing about these figures was um, just getting a heap of stuff. Like this guy's coming with his little attack sled. Uh, yeah, got his flippers. It looks like a great figure. It's probably um, like this 1994 set of figures. We did get some really nice stuff in there before it went to G.I. Joe Extreme. Um, and it sort of shows level a high level of disappointment that they went to Kenner and did that Extreme line because it, it was just bad. Um, okay, next up, we have Action Soldier. Uh, my first years in the Army were extreme extremely valuable as they served as the foundation upon which my G.I. Joe career would be built. Every G.I. Joe worth his weight in ammo received training at one of the U.S. military branches, although no training can replace field experience when it comes to raw combat. When the shells start exploding and the bullets start to fly, you better know how to react with split-second reflexes. As a G.I. Joe, you not only learn when to stand and fight, but when to take cover as well. Once again, uh, we're just getting all these accessories with this. Uh, in the case of this guy, it was uh, like little barricade walls. Um, and depending if you got the V1, V2, it was just different colored walls. It's cool to see you still get your little flag points with this as well. I don't know what promotions were on around that 94 era, but they were still giving you flag points, which was nice. Okay, actual G.I. Joe. Um, I find this really weird and awkward when I try to mention him because 
you're just listing, you know, G.I. Joe. Uh, but this is the actual G.I. Joe. If you haven't seen or heard of this before, and it's quite possible, and that's okay. Um, so this was the part that Bruce Willis played in, I believe, the second Joe movie as Joe Colton. Um, and he is actual G.I. Joe, like first guy. So his file card says, just straight up, duty, honor, country. Not just words, a way to live your life. Um, G.I. Joe, a.k.a. Joseph B. Colton, graduated in 1960 from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, receiving the Academy's highest possible honors. An expert marksman, he is proficient with all modern weaponry from the M60 to attack helicopters and light armored weapons. Recruited by Special Forces, Colton was destined for military glory, quickly distinguishing him, himself as an outstanding Green Beret. In 1963, after participating in ultra top secret combat operations and extensive, extensive tours of duty in trouble spots around the world, uh, First Lieutenant Colton became the most decorated and most feared battlefield soldier the world had ever seen. Recognising Colton's innate combat skills and his warrior heart-pumping courage through his veins, then-President JFK secretly selected him to create and command an ultimate freedom fighting force. High-ranking soldiers have been passed over for this elite presidential appointment. Colton was issued his code name G.I. Joe and began building his team with the toughest men the mil or the armed services could muster. From there, G.I. Joe would change the course of military history and redefine the word hero. Um, yeah, it was because we didn't get this straight away, I don't think. Um, I've covered this character in one of my other videos, and yeah, it's just cool. It's a cool figure, uh, big sweet ass machine gun there. I've never seen this before, um, and I was a bit surprised because uh, you know, not an expert on things, uh, was just surprised to see it in, um, like when I saw the second Joe movie and Joe Cotton was mentioned, um, like. I went away and researched it all and yeah, I just didn't know about it. Um, but it's great, great seeing it all now and it all makes sense. Um, and one last, this one just cracked me up the most. Uh, so it's the fighter pilot. So this recolored version of the 30th anniversary action pilot was only available at the 1994 International G.I. Joe Collectors Convention, which was held in New York. Uh, come with its own collector's box. Um, but most fascinating was the design on the uniform with the red, white, and blue striping down the arms and legs, as well as G.I. Joe logos on the legs. Uh, it was patterned after the jumpsuits of the G.I. Joe skydiving team, which was touring the country at the time. Check out that poster. It is fascinating. Uh, before, um, you know, doing the research for this video, did not even know this was a thing. Did not even know that, uh, yeah, Snake Eyes, Ninja Commando, looked like that. Um, yeah. So and what a great figure as well. I think out of everything I've seen today, that uh, fighter pilot figure is just fantastic. Uh, he's got his parachute. Um, you know, he's got his respirator and his helmet. But, yeah, that uniform is great. Uh, that's, it, that's something I'll be looking for in the future, I reckon, just to add to my collection. Um, and that poster of those, uh, those guys, wow. That looks like something that I want to go and get printed on uh, to some poster, movie poster size 
get it laminated and chuck it on the wall. That is fantastic. Uh, I've left this to last because it just caused me so much delight uh, in making this video. So that's G.I. Joe's last 15. Uh, thank you, 1994. Um, we've got some really good figures out of that year and fresh ones as well. So the B1s, uh, yeah, I, I thought there were some really nice ones. Um, did you enjoy the video? Let me know in the comments. If you're not currently subscribe, subscribe to my account, um, please hit that sub button. Hit that like button if you enjoyed the con content and uh, yeah, we'll see you in future videos. So thanks very much for watching and bye-bye.